Hello and welcome to another Punter's Guide, a very special one this weekend, of course. It is Champions Day at Ascot. We crown champions, both human and equine, at the Royal Racetrack of Ascot this Saturday. Jason Weaver is alongside me. And Jason, it's this culmination of what's been a fantastic season, especially for William Buick and, of course, especially for a horse we'll see for the final time on Saturday by Eid. Yeah, how good is it that we've got William Buick already coming out and saying that he'll definitely go for the championship next year? Because if you wanted to be super, super tough, if you like, you could say, well, Oshin wasn't about and how's it going to be when he's there and they're at one meeting a day. So well done to, to William. It's a brilliant effort for him, the way that he has um, disciplined himself, his attitude, his professionalism, to go out there and get it done. Absolutely fantastic. As far as the youngsters are concerned, good battle between Benoit and Harry. Benoit is going to be crowned the champion apprentice, so well done to him. And he looks to have a, a bright future. Both boys look to have a very, very bright future. And then we, we go on to Baid, you know, however many million thoroughbreds have been born since he has come along. Um, and he's, he's the only one who has had the power, the potential and the attributes to be talked about in the same breath as Frankel. And now he's right on the edge of stepping up to that plate again and having one, one final swing for the boundaries. Yeah, of course, looking to emulate the great Frankel as well by taking the champion stakes. So more on that a little later. We'll work through the races, though, in order, starting with the Long Distance Cup. But I was looking at this. No three-year-old has won this race since it's been switched to Ascot. Two big contenders here this year, though. An elder elder of the ledger winner, the Irish says winner, uh, Waterville. And we've got Trushan on a hat-trick. But for the first time, he showed a few wayward tenders at Doncaster. That, for me, would be a concern. Yeah, look, um, yeah, look, Coltrane managed to win at Doncaster. Quickthorn was brilliant when he managed to get away at York. Um, the Lonsdale, he was off and gone. It was a ridiculous sort of race, wasn't it? Trawler Man comes in after winning at Goodwood and the Ebor. When you look at the two Aidens runners, Wordsworth, he's probably in there as a pacemaker. Waterville, he, he won the Irish Cesarevich, but he crept in at the bottom. I think he was 30th, wasn't he, as far as the weights were concerned. This is a, a different ball game. The two you mentioned, it's going to be a ding-dong battle between those two, isn't it? Eldar and also Trushan. Um, it's which way you want to go? Nine pound? It's a massive amount of weight over this sort of distance. That's what the three-year-olds get from the older horses. So immediately that puts you on the, and you think, oh, nine pounds over the sprint distances, the, the, the gap gets narrower, which always surprises me because I think the older sprinters hold a bit of an advantage. Whereas with the staying division, that nine pound is a massive amount. However, Trushan, for all that we say that Holly Doyle is fantastic, and she is, don't get me wrong, but she hasn't been at her best on him in the last twice. Once at Goodwood, Went far too early, set the engine alight going down the hill. And then at Doncaster, it's a massive long straight, four and a half, nearly five furlongs as you come into the straight there. She went outside and started putting the taps on early. And what happened? He was all over the place and they can blame it on the ground as much as they want to. However, I don't think we've seen the best of him the last twice. And he can serve it up to the youngster. I think it's going to be an absolute belter. Yeah, sticking with him then to make it three long distance cups uh, in a row for True Show. We move from the stayers then to the sprinters, the champion sprint, the second race on the card. About some upsets in this in recent uh, years. Don Juan Triumphant, 33 to 1. Sands of Marley, 28 to 1. Well, Creative Force was your winner 12 months ago, and he is back for more. Yeah, look, um, I think his next second in the pattern and Jubilee was, was very, very good form. He's drawn in 13. I've been listening to what they're talking about, the track. They've doled us away from that stand side rail. So it's going to be a, a little bit further out. And Chris Stickle's saying sort of middle to, to low numbers possibly going to be favoured. But surely a group one track, the best in the country, has got to be even all the way across. That's what we're hoping for anyway. Paces an even split, the likes of Art Power, who runs this track particularly well. Brad the Brief, we haven't seen him since his Greenland success. Maybe he's overpriced. And you've got horses like Garrus, who was only three quarters of a length behind um, the superstar Highfield Princess over in the pre-Morris de Geest. Kinross, 
How did he travel in the foray when he came tanking up there like that and then he goes and weighs and wins? I mean, it's it's an absolute belter. When you mentioned about there being upsets, when Don won triumphant won this, it was that deep, wasn't it? I mean, it was absolutely hot deep. So not quite going to be that. I'm going to give Naval Crown a real roll of the dice. I think that the last twice the ground has been a little bit too quick for him. He's just scraping into double digits from a price perspective. And um, Doyle is back off that wrist injury. And hopefully he's firing on all cylinders. But just slightly easier ground will suit him perfectly. The Naval Crown then. The Platinum Jubilee winner back for more at Ascot then to be the champion sprinter for Jason. We move on to the Phillies and Mares, which is equally as competitive, uh, I think, even though it's a smaller field. We've got Emily Upjohn looking to bounce back to her Oaks form, disappointing to the track. Was that the ground in the King George? We've got Eternal Pearl, who's been on a right roll at a real busy time of it, though. William Buick in the Charlie Apri. And last year's winner, Ishara. She was 16 to 1 last year. She'll be much shorter this year, uh, Jason. We yet to win in three starts this term. Yeah, and as far as um, Ashada is concerned, um, Jim Crowley said blatantly didn't stay when she was putting her place behind Mimic U at Doncaster last time. So um, he obviously feels that she goes there with with every opportunity. Cela Rosa has been going through the grades. I like the way that she managed to dig in and win last time over in France. What happened to Emily Upjohn in the King George? You know, she was on a roll. We thought she was a superstar, sand down, shot to the head of all the markets. Musidora bolts up, unlucky. Undoubtedly, she was unlucky. Was that the start of the rift between Gosden and Dittori that we've seen throughout the campaign? Just gets beat there. Comes out in the King George, running away early on. And we've all been talking about the Trainers' Championship as if it's Charlie Appleby and William Haggis. John Gosden's got some brilliant opportunities on this card. And with nearly four million up for grabs, he could get a, a real prize money haul. It'll just drag him slightly back into contention. I think that Emily Upjohn will take a world of beating. Um, they've given her an awful long time to settle down, relax and come back to her absolute best and been aimed at this. And if there was one, Matt, and I'd like to find one at a bit of a price, you'll remember Alba Flora's win around here over course and distance, enlisted company. She looks spectacular. She gets her ideal track, trip, conditions, course and distance, absolutely fun. Everything is in her favour to run really, really big. She's disappointed on two so far. The Beckett team couldn't be in better form. And at 40s, 50s, wherever she is in the market, I think she's a massive each-way player. So Alba Flora had a huge each-way price, but I think Emily will be too good. Yeah, isn't it? I think she was odds on, wasn't she, to beat uh, was it Hamish, I think, earlier in the season at Chester at Alba Flora. Yeah, very impressive in winning that contest a couple of years ago uh, for Wraith Beckett and Rosa Ryan. Right, let's move on to the uh, the QE2 then, which is like on the undercard nowadays, uh, the big group one over the straight mile. In Spiral, lots of people see this one as a banker for Jonathan Thady Gosden and Frankie de Tory, but they've had Palace Pier beaten in this at short prices the last two years, and this is probably a most competitive contest she's tackled to date. Now, let's think back as well, Matt. Think back to what the ground was riding like on this day last year when Baid managed to win and Palace Pier. And um, everybody thinking, oh, was that another one we've just talked about? Palace Pier, was that not Dutori's greatest moment in the saddle? That's what everybody was thinking. You know, we didn't know that Baid was just going through onto superstardom at that particular time. Um, he's, a, he's a fascinating lineup this time round. Jadumi who's going through the grades nicely, managed to win quite well. Didn't look great in his coat at Goodwood, still managed to overcome that dominant over an island. The Revenant, he's going to want any rain that we could see. Modern Games, a Breeders' Cup juvenile winner. He managed to win the Woodbine Mile when we last saw him. Any ease in the ground is going to suit him. He's got a bit scratchy action now, so he's had plenty of racing. But it's all about Inspiral, isn't it? Surely if she turns up in anything like the form from, from the coronation, she's going to go around here and just zip away from them late on. 121 is her official rating at the moment. Modern Games is bang there as far as she is concerned on ratings. One pound better at the moment, but um, he's going to find it tough going in against her. The Forgotten Horse, El Drama at the top of the pack. Fatter than me when he ran behind Muta Sabek. Um, up at Newmarket last time, and um, he's going to—he's been primed for a big run. Could be a huge day for David Egan again. Another massive amount of money on offer. 
Yeah, don't forget that one. That had a big price. I know you always like to find one. It had a big price, El Drama, then Cudrowell, but in Spiral for Jason, the one in the QE2. And then let's talk about the superstar that is by Then 10 from 10, six group ones. I mean, you can wax lyrical and superlatives uh, about him forever. This is his toughest task to date, though. Can we make a case for, for, for backing like in a day? He's the highest rated rival he's ever taken on. He's a derby winner. Obviously, he was well beaten this last year. That was on the back of that long busting run in the Art of Triumph. We hope he goes to the paddocks unbeaten and obviously uh, takes his record intact. But at the prices, is, is there a value call to maybe side with a Godolphin runner? Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if you're digging in and trying to find something that's going to give him a run, you know, you're latching on to Bay Bridge's return run in the Brigadier Gerard when he absolutely zipped in. He went off favourite um, in the eclipse behind Vedini, remember? So he's not reached his full potential. There's nothing, no better man than Sir Michael Stout for prepping one for these big races. I don't underestimate him. Um, you've got the likes of... Royal champion shouldn't be good enough. Max Swinney's a 2,000 guineas winner. Um, Stone Age down the bottom has turned into a bit of a front runner for his stable mates after winning the Derby trial. It, it, I think that Adar's win at Doncaster was nothing short of spectacular. Small field, but he looked really, really good. And this is going to, dare I say, nearly decide the trainers' championship, isn't it? There's little between those two at the moment. I just have a sneaky... By Eid, on good to soft ground, and it's going to be at least that, didn't win by miles beating um, last year when we were talking about Palace Pier, did he? He didn't beat him by miles. It wasn't like his most impressive victory. This is his toughest ass today. Adair has to get everything right. Buick has to time things to an absolute nicety up on the front end. He can't go flat out um, and then not finish off because you'll get picked up late. And if you go too slow... Baid will be far too quick in the closing stages. He just got to gently drag him out into that real deep water and make it incredibly tough for him. Um, look, I hope Baid goes and wins, but I'll be back in Adair. Yeah, I think it kind of makes sense to say at the price. He's the highest rated rival that he's ever taken on. He's a dog winner and he's fresh, isn't he? He's going to be fresh as anything with just that one run today. So, yeah, so, yeah I kind of agree with you then uh, with a day out with a value call against Baye. But we'd love to see him, of course, remain unbeaten for, for the racing, really, as the story. But, look, get rid of all your group ones. I say the proper race to the last. This is what they like. <laughs> Big field handicap over the straight mile. All the usual suspects. Uh, lining up again. I thought last year's second symbolise was interesting. He's been well back now. He's a lot shorter than he, he was earlier on in the week. But I looked at the run of runnings of this. All run-ins of the Balmoral Handicap, they've ended up on the far side. So is a low draw important? Yeah, I mean, it could be. And look, I'm just leaning on everything that Chris Stickles has said. You know, we're, we're talking about a Group 1 track. There shouldn't be any bias. However, he's sort of saying the centre may well be the place to be with that stands rail just dulled off a little bit, if you like. So um, for that reason, I've ended up going right down on the low side um, with Perotto. Now, he's dropped an awful long way in the handicap. It's some very, very good form. We all know about his Royal Ascot success here as well. Harry Davis, second in the Apprentice Championship. Could he get a massive victory on the board? The biggest, it would be the biggest of his career. There's a huge amount of prize money on offer. And I just feel that he's well handicapped and with the extra three pound off his back. Now you're diving in, you're looking at the ground twice, only twice he's encountered ground nearly as soft as he's going to encounter on Saturday. So I feel that these sort of conditions could just squeeze about a bit of improvement from a well handicapped runner. He's a big price. He's 16, somewhere around there. And you mentioned the old favourites, you know, this pace from Shalir in, in, in 11. Johan is drawn down in three. Seems ages since he was winning the Lincoln, doesn't it? You know, but he'd be taking them along and giving them something to aim at. So, yeah, I think Perotto in a wide open heat will give you a big run for your money. Yeah, Perotto right up the far rail in stall one. Great day. Cannot wait for it. What would be your idea of a best bet on the card at Ascot uh, on Saturday? I think that um, the, the way that John Gosden plays his hand is always important uh, to take notice. And, um, you know, it, it's been a good year uh, for the team without being spectacular. But they may well have Emily Upjohn primed back to some of that early season form. And she might just be able to zip away from these. It will take Detori's brilliance to get her to switch off. 
But I think that's why she's had 84 days off, getting her to relax, getting her back into that rhythm. And there's no better man on the big day. There certainly isn't then. Maybe a Frankie flying dismount in his second home ascot. Uh, Jason, after the Phillies and Mares, fingers crossed for Emily Upjohn. It's been a brilliant season. But we're looking forward to a fantastic day at Ascot on Champions Day. Thanks, Jason, for joining us. Whatever you're back in this weekend, best of luck.